This is why Small Business Matters from Northumbria University, supporting small businesses with the Help to Grow Management Programme. Welcome to Why Small Business Matters from the Help to Grow Management team within Newcastle Business School at Northumbria University. This series provides a platform for successful small business leaders to tell their stories, offer advice and unravel what it means to be a successful modern SME. My name is Hannah Hesselgreaves and in this episode we're exploring the world of health. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Philpott, the CEO of Newcastle Premier Health Group. Following a 10-year career in the British Army as a specialist physiotherapist, Mark has been a leading figure in occupational health business, leading the pivot of NPH Group. They provide face-to-face and remote home and work-based assessments, health surveillance, medicals, testing and education services to individuals and businesses and more recently are leading providers of health screening and testing products including COVID-19 lateral flow tests supported with online verification and monitoring technologies. Welcome Mark. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Very honoured to be here. Could you just start out by telling us a bit about what NPH do and how might a listener at home have come across you? Yes, absolutely. So NPH uh, was a a business born out of um, a passion of four of our uh, founding doctors who were all GPs actually uh, originally, but discovered um, their, their own individual passion for occupational medicine. And uh, so they went on and uh, and trained to became to become um, occupational health physicians, and um, and that's how the business was born. It became a limited business back in 2013. But what we're all about really now is providing um, occupational health and health and well-being solutions for businesses. But also we've got a main clinic up in Newcastle where people can come in and get uh, employment medicals um, and see see the doctors privately. But most of the work is about business to business, providing nurses into um, local business for occupational health and well-being purposes. And in the last two years, I'd say you've been under massive transformation, haven't you? You've had a you've had a brand relaunch, you've had new premises. So tell us a bit about what's been going on in the last two years. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've been sort of ticking along. I joined the business in 2016 and um, like any small business we've we've been on our own sort of roller coaster and journey um, of growth and development um, over the last sort of six years Um, and uh, we were doing very well in in, in many respects and building a good solid reputation for um, providing you know reliable occupational health and well-being services into the northeast and local businesses and um, and just when you thought everything was going really hunky dory, um, the pandemic struck. So uh, it, it was an interesting time because we had to um, pivot very quickly into starting to think about how we could do things um, differently. And, um, and and so we did. And I, I suppose because we've been working in um, occupational health and and well-being, it felt natural to us to think a little bit outside the box about how we could best. I suppose serve the um, the local population first and foremost um, to help businesses deal with with the pandemic because like like every other business um, in the northeast and I don't think there's probably one that hasn't been impacted in some shape or form um, we've all we've all had to cope with with the change and it's probably one of the biggest changes that most of us have faced as business owners it's probably one of the biggest changes we've we've faced in in our in our business um, lifetime i would imagine there can't be many other that have had such a profound impact on on uh, on business so it it was really interesting and we had a choice to make because you know due to the nature of what we do a lot of our uh, businesses um, fell off a cliff really in terms of the requirement for for our services um, because a lot of what we do is face-to-face uh, nursing in in the business, and of course all the restrictions, uh, you know, uh, limited all of that, and and all the regulations and guidelines that came in made it very difficult to provide the services that we would traditionally uh, provide on a face-to-face level. So um, so we we sort of got round the table and and started looking very quickly at what we could do, and and felt that we could, you know, start looking at how to. Uh, collaborate in different ways with other organizations and start looking at different models of providing um, occupational health um, that would allow us to keep supporting businesses um, as best we could, especially here in the Northeast, uh, where we're based in Newcastle, um, so that that we could maintain our own business, but also continue to serve um, other people. And that opened up a whole 
a whole sort of um, different approach to how MPH Group, um, you know, w w was able to move forward. And as you rightly say, yeah, thankfully, I'm sitting here now talking to you, having made a success of that and having done a lot for local business and, and been able to support um, uh, people where we could doing what we do in healthcare. And as a consequence of that, uh, we actually grew um, enormously in the end. And uh, we've been able to reinvest some of that capital into the business. And uh, as you rightly point out, we've moved into new a new head office and new premises, uh, which has been great for the staff and great for the brand um, and great for our reputation in, in the area. Uh, and now we're trying to sort of, you know, capitalize on that and, and pivot again, almost in a post pandemic uh, phase. But yes, you, you, you're right. The, the pandemic certainly brought some challenges, but I feel that we were able to um, uh, make some, some decisions and, and pivot around it as, as, as best we could, which has been a success for us. There may be some small businesses that are listening to this podcast and thinking, pandemic or no pandemic, something's not working in my business. I feel like I need to pivot it. I feel like I need to make a change. But I know what I know and I know my business inside out and I created it from my bedroom or whatever. How, how, yeah. how, what was that experience like? How does it actually feel? I, I imagine it to be quite scary, but how does it feel to do that? And what supported you and what sort of helped you create that change in such a rapid space? space of time yeah great great question i mean i look i mean we all we all draw on our experiences don't we through life and um i've been very privileged um in, in many ways to have been exposed to all sorts of different uh, industries and experiences through through my career and i suppose um when the pandemic hit it, it really was a question of you know having a conversation with with myself and and with the team because you know what what's important from my perspective is that it's not about how any one individual business leader or owner um, necessarily views um, what they should do in order to make a success of a challenge. It's about how you, um, in, my, in my humble opinion, it's about how you engage with your team and um, you know, discuss the realities of, of where you are and what you're trying to achieve and, and make it a team effort. And that's what we that's what we tried to do. We tried to kind of sit down and and consider, um, you know, how we should um, approach the problem together, um, and how we would um, choose to face up to that problem. Because I think fundamentally that there were two choices. You you could either you could either sort of accept your fate that the pandemic was out of your control and there's nothing you could do about it, and 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 that that was you know an inevitable consequence of that was going to be that the business would suffer and you, you might have to close the business and you might have to move on to something new or, or you could try and you know draw on your your all of your experiences and all of your knowledge and collective efforts to think about um, how to do things differently and, and, and just consider how to work outside of the box and get a wee bit uncomfortable with that and stretch your um, your imagination your creativity to find a different uh, way of, of looking at the problem. And I, I've always felt that, you know, as, as a business owner now, um, you know, working with a, a fantastic team, it was always going to be about how we chose to face up to the problem and to take things forward in baby steps and to break it down into um, elements that were manageable and not to be scared by the prospect of, um, you know, what others might perceived to be, you know, an inevitable um, doom scenario, because because it wasn't. And for many organisations, they have been able to, um, to to pivot. They have been able to change, and some, some of that change has actually brought out the very best um, in in their businesses. And that was certainly our experience. You know, it resulted in us having different conversations with different partners, and that resulted in different collaborations and. It was about us being open to different ideas from other people and not necessarily coming at the problem, believing that, you know, um, that, that, that there's a there's a there's a limited scope for, for what you can do and not constraining your, your thinking around um, where the boundaries of that possibility are. And I think just by by adopting that sort of open mindset and choosing to face it as an opportunity rather than seeing it as a as a challenge that was going to um, result in 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 
in real real difficulties uh, th th then then there's sort of a, a natural order of things which happens you know conversations start opening up uh, people start wanting to reach out and help um, and I, I've always believed that you know if you if, if, if you if you put out there into the world, into the community, then you, you can expect to, to, to get an awful lot back because by and large, there are lots of people around us who are willing to help and support. And, and I think leaving, you know, one, one of my favorite uh, um, sort of bits of advice that's been given to me in the past is that, you know, your, your, um, your ego is not your amigo. And I, and I think that I've always said to people that work here that they should leave their leave any little ego that they might have at the door and don't let it become a barrier to, to how you, you 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 welcome in advice and help and support from other people. And and when you do, it, it's amazing what uh, what opportunities open up. And, and I guess that's part of the story that we we've been on and, and, and how we've been able to leverage some of the success over the last two years. You've been in healthcare for a for most of most of your career haven't you in one way shape or form as a practicing phys physiotherapist so and then obviously then moving into moving into business so what is the passion that gets you out of bed in the morning and that, that made you want to work in business yeah great question I mean when I when I started off you know I was probably I don't know how typical this is but I had no idea what I wanted to do with my my career when I went through school um, and you know I wasn't a, a flying academic by any stretch of the imagination but I was a hard worker and a trier and, and I think uh, that probably came from you know some of the influence from my, my, my parents obviously and, and my dad was a, a Royal Marine for, for, for 36 years and there was a certain sort of you know uh, um, you know upbringing that 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 taught me to be um, independent and um, and resilient to a certain extent and and I think in the early stages it was all about you know learning to um, develop a, a sort of an assuredness about about what you wanted to do but the challenge for me was I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do so I had, had the confidence to kind of try new things but really didn't know which way to go um, so I just in the end sort of followed my my passion for what what I enjoyed and th th that started off um, with me doing a, a gap year and went off and travelled and then did a degree in sports science at Liverpool John Moores University, which was fascinating and really interesting. Um, but even having done that, I still didn't know really which way to go. And it was actually a, a lecture that we had from a visiting uh, physiotherapist who came uh, to the university to talk to us about physio. And up until that point in time, I'd never really you know, thought about physiotherapy as an option, but it struck a chord with me uh, when I heard this um, this lecture, and it, I, I just related to it, and I thought, oh, that, that sounds really interesting. It was all about connecting with people. It was about, you know, being able to do something that would impact people's lives in a very sort of hands-on and personal approach. Um, and there was lots of scope to take, you know, a career in physiotherapy into all sorts of different directions. And I was never probably going to be the sort of person that was going to be pursuing a career in medicine or something like that. Um, so it felt like a, a nice compromise position for me and something that I was interested in. So, um, you know, so I, anyway, I, I decided to look into it and, and um, became a sort of a, um, you know, a, 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 someone that was keen to Stay, stay a student forever and apply to, to apply for another degree in physiotherapy and went to Bath University immediately after the first one and did a further three years to, to become qualified as a physiotherapy physiotherapist um, and that resulted in going into uh, my rotational first rotational job in Bournemouth um, at the uh, at the uh, Christchurch and Bournemouth Hospital a trust down there which was really interesting um, and gradually I developed Cut a long story short, I, I, I developed a, a real interest in how to, you know, deliver, um, I suppose, services and a, 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 an approach that was all about enabling people to live um, a healthier, happier um, lifestyle. Uh, not because of any particular issues I'd had or any injuries I'd experienced, but just because there was a sense that there were a lot of people out there in the world who um, who struggled to really break down um, health care into manageable um, manageable pieces that that, that 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 they can work with to 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 you know live a healthy life and I suppose I kind of connected with that and identified in it and then i I developed a bit of a 
passion for how to do that through um you know through organizational systems and 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 structures and that took me into wanting to take my career forward as quickly as i could and i ended up joining the army um after my first couple of years in the nhs um and that was at a time when the army was just beginning to recognize that there was real value in physiotherapy and rehabilitation and there was a wartime role uh, for for physiotherapists um which really excited me too so I, I, I applied and joined and, and developed a really good awareness of how systems of delivering rehabilitation and healthcare can impact people's lives. And of course, you know, in the military, um, the impact is usually pretty severe. You know, p- people lose arms and legs and, and end up, in, you know, picking up pretty pretty nasty injuries in their in their career. So for me, I was able to kind of nurture this idea of of how you could develop systems. Uh, for for delivering rehabilitation to 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 people and care models, uh, and I suppose the last point that, that, that on that is that you know when I when I look back at my time in the NHS and, and then I looked at my time in the military, it became clear to me that there were you know ways of doing it that that could drive real efficiencies in how healthcare is delivered, and I used to be and still am to a certain extent quite frustrated by um you know not by 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 people not being able to tap into um systems of healthcare that would deliver what they need in its most simplest format uh, but that also were were you know p- potentially not not being accessed in the most effective and most um most cost effective way so for me it was you know what gets me out of bed now is is being able to have the opportunity to think about ways in which we can deliver healthcare models. Um, of course, now it's in occupational health. When I started, it was all through physiotherapy and allied healthcare professional health, um, and, and find ways of of delivering healthcare models that makes it accessible to people, and makes it um, easy to connect with, and makes it affordable, and makes it efficient. And I think you know, I, I, I'm always striving to try and find. Um, new ways of, of delivering healthcare that ultimately um, makes it easy for the healthcare population to both in business and at home to uh, to access it. I think, Hannah, if, <laughs> it's a very long answer. I'm sorry about that. No, I think I think I wanted to pick up on one or two points because I think this is where um, NPH and your your approach to thinking about service delivery models is really unique because most people, certainly in the UK, I suppose, think about um, their healthcare services being the public service, the NHS and the, the bits that are bolted onto it. But here we are in the private sector talking about end-to-end models of service delivery. So where do you see the interface between the public and the private sector and, and kind of the playground that you're in in relation to the whole system? Yeah, well, look, I mean, it, it's worth it's worth saying that, you know, I, I started my career, as I've said, as a physiotherapist in the NHS, and I'm, I'm a massive fan of the NHS. We're, we're massively privileged, really, as a country to have the NHS. It's the world's best brand yeah, in, in many respects. And, and the, 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 there's a point in saying that because um, I think in some respects, as a brand, uh, the the NHS has become its 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 worst enemy, <laughs> because as much as it offers a huge amount to everybody, it's become this huge organisation trying to serve a population that's you know getting older um, by by the year, uh, with the population growing. With I mean, right now everybody's feeling the pinch, um, um, because resources can only go so far. The cost of medicine. Um, is always on the on the up as new technologies come on online and new ways of, of, of providing medicine becomes you know increasingly more expensive um, both in the pharma world and also in in medical device technology and in terms of pure service delivery and I think it's a real challenge for politicians for government and for us as a society to understand how to strike the balance between what we really need from the NHS as a healthcare service to help uphold public health in the UK, whilst at the same time um, recognising that it's limited 
and it's 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 a resource um, that we have to manage carefully. And no matter what people say um, within any political party, uh, there's only so much you can do to raise um, you know the funds to support the ongoing um, deliverables that people expect from the NHS. And I've fundamentally come to a conclusion in my mind that the NHS um, is an incredible um, outfit, but its future should lie in looking after um, um, looking after acute medicine, looking after chronic disease management, um, and um, dealing with being excellent at reactive medicine. Whereas the responsibility for proactive healthcare and how we, as individuals and as businesses, start to look at how we can, almost from a, from a social good point of view, start to think about um, ways in which we can protect our NHS as a scarce resource. Think about starting to move the needle of responsibility away from looking at the NHS as sort of the be all or end all for, for any, any form of um, um, health problem and start to look at how we can shift towards enabling individual people through business um, to, to look at preventative health care uh, before it actually happens. Because then what we'll end up with is a, is a society where the NHS is fantastic at fixing you when it all goes wrong, using the latest technology, using the, using the latest drugs, um, using the latest, latest advances in, in, in medicine um, to, to really get under the skin, no, no pun intended, of, of, of you know, helping to fix the problem. But if we can find a way through our models of healthcare and the way in which we access healthcare as individuals um, and with the support of, of our employers to start thinking about um, prevention in a much bigger way, in exactly the same way as the world is hopefully starting to wake up to, to how we deal with climate change. And you know, look, at, look at this week, <laughs> um, you know, we, we've had the hottest, hottest uh, temperatures on record um, and, and, and there's really only a, what, one answer to this, as we all know, moving forward, and it's about prevention. But where does that responsibility sit? It sits with what we do as individuals at home, but it also sits within the environments where we spend most of our working life, i.e. with our employers. And, you know, we've got amazing um, services that can deal and react to problems and issues when they arise with climate change um, and we need that and we need to invest in that but the analogy is true for healthcare if we can start to really adopt an individual approach to preventative medicine and find a different way of accessing that and becoming much more self-aware with good education and good support structures at home and in the business that we are employed in then we will start to take off um, some of the pressures from uh, from the NHS and enable the NHS to become um, something um, something different moving forward that is sustainable. And ultimately, Hannah, I think for me it's about how you, how we create sustainability in healthcare. Um, we all want to live longer. We all want to have um, happier, um, you know, longer lives, and uh, and take our health into retirement. And, um, you know, th th there's no getting away from the fact that the, 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 the most impactful way of doing that is by, you know, educating people as early as possible in all the little steps they can take at home and in the workplace um, to prevent, um, you know, ill health rather than just, you know, accepting that it's your fate and that when it happens, the NHS will put me right. And it's a wonderful um, distinction there that you've made between the NHS is, is quite illness orientated in a way. And, and what you're wanting to advocate is that moving of the needle towards health and health and well-being, um, which I think is really, really important. We had Baroness Tani Gray um, Thompson on the podcast last month and she said and I think I can quote um, we need to think about how people can be healthy for the whole of their lives and she was obviously talking about professional athletes but I know that that's sort of something that's really important to you and a lot of what MPH group do is around education as well so I'm just what, what do you think that 
employers and employees could be doing to help this healthy society vision you've got? Yeah, and I, I think first of all, it, it, it starts with having a conversation. It's, it's about, it's about um, listening um, to employees in the workplace and putting together opportunities and forums for discussion because you know as, as you know people have said to me you know in the past you know, God gave us you know two ears and one mouth for a reason we should listen twice more than we talk and I think sometimes there's this idea that as business owners we, we know best and that we, we we know what is right for our our employees um, and I think sometimes, you know, with the best will in the world, um, even some of the best business um, um, owners uh, don't have all the answers. And I think when it comes to healthcare, and it comes to how we engage people in the workforce um, around this subject, it's about understanding what their needs are. And the, and the fact is that everybody's different. And what's been great about the last sort of decade really is that gradually we're starting to see so many of the taboo subjects opening up as a conversation. And I think, I think business leaders have a responsibility to encourage that. You know, mental health and physical health. In, in the past, we only ever talked about physical health. We only ever talked about people injuring their backs in the workplace or, you know, uh, the musculoskeletal injury. But, but when it came to mental health, there was never really a discussion to be had. So I think the point here is that it's about encouraging a discussion that breaks down taboos, that makes it feel socially acceptable in the workplace and normal to talk about, you know, healthcare. Um, you know, one of the challenges around this has been that, you know, p- people feel that healthcare is somehow a very personal um, experience, and it is, of course, but but one that you can't talk about because it's 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 personal to you and it's not for sharing, and it's not for it's not for um, discussion. Whereas actually, and there's some great studies, you know, starting to come out of the United States around this sort of area where they're, they're finding that if you if you create um, um, a social um, culture within your business that encourages a conversation, the impact on um, reducing um, ill health, even without a physician in the room or a nurse in the room, is significant. Uh, just by simply having a conversation, may, maybe maybe led by a health coach or someone who is able to steer the conversation in the right direction, but just encouraging people to come together to talk about it. So, for example, you know, people that might be a little bit overweight or might be pre-diabetic or might be at risk of cardiovascular disease. You know, I, I suspect if you looked around your your um, employee group, and we all struggle with it to some to some extent, there will be people who will. Um, be suffering um, or even if they don't feel they're suffering they will be at risk um, of perhaps in the future suffering if they don't if they don't um, you know seek um, support and bring that conversation out at at an earlier stage rather than waiting for it to happen and then you know as we said before relying on the NHS to react to that and, and put you right so the first thing I would say is let's try and open up a conversation in the workplace that encourages people to talk in a safe space, um, maybe facilitated. Uh, people are familiar in a business um, um, sort of speak of uh, you know, how to use focus groups. Uh, if we were talking about um, new ways of marketing, you know, our products and our services, you know, that that's that's you know second nature to most business owners. Um, but when it comes to actually looking at um, socialising subjects within focus groups that matter to your employees, that's less, that's less acceptable, it's less the norm. So I think that would be a great place to start. And then once you understand the kind of the general pattern or the trends of what people are thinking and talking about, you can go in and start to do all sorts of, um, uh, you know, health checks. You, you can start to look at um, um, various forms of health screening. You know, one of the pillars of what we offer as, as, a, as an organisation, we break our services down as a model into pillars of care. And, and I see the future of, of our model of, of health care being much more geared towards health education and health screening. So once you understand where the problems are in the workplace, you can start to dig a bit deeper, a bit like with uh, 
you know, from a university point of view with, with your statistics, you know, you start off at a very high level and then you, you dig a little bit deeper and a bit deeper and business owners will relate to this in terms of budgets. You have a higher level sort of view on, you know, where you start and you just dig a bit deeper and a bit deeper until you get to a point where you understand the issue. And then you can, you can go in there and start looking at different forms of health screening that will start to bring some of those issues to life. So, and these days it's fantastic because there are so many different ways of cheaply and affordably screening for different types of health issues. Um, you know, whether it's to do with glucose monitoring or whether it's to do with, um, you know, questionnaires that help to identify, uh, you know, any, any, any particular uh, mental health risks or physical risks. Um, you, whether it's to do with, well, of course, top, topically uh, over the last two years, you know, everybody's familiar with the lateral flow test now for COVID testing, but there's all sorts of lateral flow tests that can be used really cheaply and affordably to look at different um, infectious diseases um, that may, maybe not so, so, so um, um, easy to talk about, but, but you, you can get into all sorts of different um, examples like um, STDs and um, uh, we're starting to look at different types of um, infectious disease like uh, like monkeypox, which is very topical at the moment, and HIV and, and TB, and there's lots of things you can do. Of course, a lot of that isn't relevant to your typical northeast um, you know business environment, but outside of that, there are lots of physical devices that can be used to um, measure um, quickly and easily uh, different types of uh, risk factors, you know, cholesterol, um, doing finger prick blood tests. Um, as long as it's supported with the right advice and guidance, um, you, you can use these different types of measures to capture um, indicators of healthcare risks and then follow that up with education and, um, and support and signposting and social prescribing that will help to move people in the right, in the right direction. But from a business point of view, it's, it's, it's understanding the trends and then looking at different forms of health screening that you can bring in to, to start to target where those, where those risks lie and then use that information to layer up education and encourage different ways of, of, of addressing the problem. You're listening to Why Small Business Matters. Find out how Northumbria University can help your business thrive through the Help to Grow Management Programme. Delivered by leading small business and enterprise experts from Northumbria University with the support of leading figures from industry and experienced entrepreneurs. The programme supports senior managers of small and medium-sized businesses to boost their business's performance, resilience and long-term growth. The 12-week programme is 90% funded by the government and the fee payable by participants is £750 and has been designed to allow participants to complete it alongside full-time work. The in-depth, high-quality curriculum supports you to build your capabilities in leadership, innovation, digital adoption, employee engagement, marketing, responsible business and financial management. By the end of the programme, you'll develop a business growth plan to help you lead your business to realise its potential. To find out more about the programme, the modules, eligibility and fees and delivery dates, go to northumbria.ac.uk slash help to grow. You're listening to Why Small Business Matters. I'm Hannah Hesselgreaves and my guest today is Mark Philpott, CEO of NPH Group based in Newcastle. Talking about opening up conversations, Mark, I've watched you in full flight and I've seen your leadership style and you are very good at opening up conversations. You have a very engaging leadership style. And I wanted to ask a bit about so where that's come from, where that inspiration's come from, have you learned that? I, I know you've been through um, through lots of leadership development type type work and you've had a, a long history in connection with universities. But I'm just wondering where you've where you've been getting your leadership development from and what's been um, the biggest inspiration for the way you've developed your style. Oh my goodness, I, I think I've been very fortunate um, to have been. Um, I suppose exposed to a lot of different people with all sorts of different leadership styles uh, during my career. Um, you know, it, it, it started with my time in the NHS. You know, my army experience was very different. It was a real contrast to the formative years in the NHS. Um, 
you know, the, the military is a very hierarchical um, type organization. It's got a very sort of top down um, sort of style, um, if you like. Um, and, and I suppose then when I got into corporate healthcare and started to contrast that again with um, how the commercial world and and as we call it as as sort of ex-military people city street does it um, you, you start to you start to kind of align different experiences um, and contrast them and and draw conclusions as to what what works and, and what doesn't work and I, I think that for me it's it's really very simple it, it, it's been about being open to continuous personal development and and never never get never get to a, never get to a point where where you believe you you know it all um, in fact the, the reverse is 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 the is the is the way i think to promote good leadership which is to to, to be very vulnerable to the idea that you don't know it all because it open it opens up a conversation with people um, people will naturally look to leaders who are you know, happy to uh, lead from the front, but that doesn't necessarily mean to, to, to say that, they, that they're the ones that have all the answers. In fact, the opposite is true in my book. You know, very often the, the, the most effective leaders are the ones who uh, you know, recognize and accept that they, they don't have all the answers and it's the team around them that do. So I found that so much of the success that we've had and, and my personal successes but also failures because I, I i do passionately believe that you know leadership is about failing forwards and learning from mistakes and, and and recognizing that we don't have all the answers and that's okay and that by by taking that um approach you you leave yourself uh, permanently vulnerable but also you, you leave yourself um or you put yourself in a very authentic position where you are you are approachable. You you are someone that people hopefully can can feel they can work with, um, and that um, you know you, you you are someone that that people are um, able to to bring ideas to the table around. And and I've always seen my job as as really just being a facilitator, just just someone who can act as a bit of glue um, and and help help stick other people's ideas together, and help to um, maybe just constantly um, flesh out uh, some of the, um, the, the, the different approaches that, that different ideas can take to create, to, to, to develop that creativity in the room that allows ideas to percolate and to come and to come through. So my style has been, you know, uh, has been influenced by a number of different uh, um, things really in my life. Uh, um, but, but I've learned, I've just learned um, that in, in order to keep moving forward in the right direction you have to you have to be open to allowing other people into your space um, to, to bring to bring ideas to the table and 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 if you can find a way of gluing that together and encouraging people to to um, to work together and collaborate then then that's where the real magic happens that's where the the, the, the success comes from and I've always I've always been someone that's been keen keen to collaborate. I think it's a it's a you know some people can from a business point of view can come at it from the perspective of wanting to you know sort of protect their own space and and and, and not be open to working with with other people because somehow they, they feel it's going to be in competition or it's going to be you know you know taking some of their market share or what have you. But actually, if you can be open um, to working alongside other people in a collaborative way, it's is no different to working with your own team then you can you can create some some incredible opportunities through um, through business collaboration as well as, as as well as collaborating with your own team um, as, a, as a as a leader I suppose and I know partnering has been a really important sort of strategic feature for for NPH group what's what's next for you and what's next for NPH group well, yes, I mean, we're going to continue on the journey of um, finding new ways of bringing healthcare to the population and to business and to do that as effectively and as efficiently as we as we can. That'll be all part of our core core business. Um, but what we're really excited about are the collaborations we've got with some of our um, other friends and colleagues. Uh, we, we're doing a lot of work with BHA Medical, um, who um, we've got to know very, very well uh, through a really... Uh, sort of strong collaboration over the last two years during the pandemic and they've become our supply chain for um, a lot of our lateral flow testing 
and uh, and we're now working and we have worked uh, collaboratively together over the last uh, two years to develop technology which um, has enabled our COVID um, services to, to take off um, that's been through Newcastle and Leeds uh, uh, Airport and also the work we've been doing out of our clinics but but the technology we've developed together um, is now taking us into a whole new realm of how we can deliver healthcare to the population and it talks to the point I, I made earlier which is trying to move the needle away from this over dependency um, on, on services that are already strained and, um, and limited in terms of what they can do towards one where what we hope to do with our technology and with our um, health screening approaches and methodology and, and devices that we can we can collaborate and work together to bring that um, to the masses um, in a very affordable and accessible way, both through face-to-face um, -face screening and, and access to, to online professional advice and guidance. And actually, the, the, what's really exciting about that is it's, it's, it's something that you can scale globally. Um, it's not limited by, by any particular marketplace. So we're focused now on taking the technology, taking the ideas, taking the screening, taking the testing um, to global markets, but, but flexing them to meet the demands of uh, different uh, target audiences, be that you know the government uh, of Zimbabwe in, in, in Africa, or whether it's um, dealing with um, niche populations within business in the UK, or um, even um, starting to open up um, markets um, as we just have done in, in the USA for starting to um, bring, bring testing to the population. So this combination of technology, models of healthcare and and um, different types of, of testing is where we're hoping to go in the future as well as consolidating around our core core business and our, our i haven't really mentioned it at the beginning but our, our six pillars of of healthcare, uh, which all focus on that occupational health and health and well-being um, model that we, we will will keep will keep championing within within our um, local business um, client base as a small business yourself, why do you think small business matters and what's important about small business in the Northeast? Yeah, br brilliant question. I think the UK um, has a reputation globally uh, for being a real advocate of small business and UK PLC is dependent on, on small business. Um, and I think it's one of those sort of unsung heroes, really, um, in terms of UK GDP. You know, there is a huge amount of revenue and creativity that's born out of small business. And, you know, what you tend to hear in the media is a lot of noise around how many small businesses fail. And, and you don't tend to hear about all the real successes of um, small businesses that succeed. You know, the media is very interested in big business stories and, you know, big successes. But it really, the, the lifeblood of that comes from the creativity of small business. And, and I think that, um, you know, why small business is so important uh, to the UK and to a global economy is because that's where the creativity comes from. You know, much of what we've spoken about today, Hannah, around different ways of delivering healthcare, um, you know, shifting the needle from public um, sector dependency to corporate healthcare. Um, and how we can um, look to do that um, on an individual level as well by improving access to different forms of, of provision of, of health services. You know, that these, these are examples of, of, of creativity and innovation and change that can only come quickly from within small business because small business is agile. Um, it can work within small teams that um, are dynamic and are creative and are entrepreneurial and want to find um, you know, new ways of doing things. I mean, you asked me the question about you know, what gets me up and, and, and uh, what, why do I do what I do? Well I, well, I do it because I'm excited by the fact that there's an opportunity in small business to do things differently, to, to create those efficiencies in healthcare to bring different models of um, enabling the public um, to, to access healthcare in a different in a different way. And I, you know, when I left my previous commercial um, um, job, I, I, you know, I started off as a physiotherapist in that organisation and ended up as head of operations. And I loved the journey of transitioning from being a clinician into being a sort of a you know, manager and leader, I suppose. Um, and, and I had a choice when I left that organization as to whether to go and work for another large 
um, corporate organization um, or maybe even the NHS uh, in some capacity. But I deliberately chose not to and to actually take the risk of um, going to work with a small business um, who needed a bit of help at the time. And I felt that I had something to bring to the table. And you know, we had a chat and a conversation about how that could be. And, you know, and here we are today, sort of five and a half, six years on, you know, doing stuff that I never would have imagined could have been possible um, you know, if I if I took myself back five, six, seven years. So that that whole idea of being in a small business environment that enables and promotes and creates new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things um, that ultimately, if we're successful in that, um, results in businesses becoming bigger, becoming in bigger employers of people, creating jobs, creating revenue, creating taxes, you know, for, 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 for the government. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a growing up journey that business has to go on and it starts. I always draw the analogy with, with, with growing up in life, you know, as, as you know, I, I would say as, as a company, MPH Group is probably just coming out of its adolescent phase. Um, we're just now becoming small or young adults in terms of how we operate and where we want to get to. And, you know, I'd like to think that the next 10 years will be a period of rapid growth and development as it would be in your in your kind of formative or younger, younger 20s. And I, and I think, you know, SMEs, the analogy of, of small business with, with growing up and how that contributes to, you know, um, a much bigger, um, more diverse uh, business community with with successes coming out of that is, is really what it's all about. Thanks once again to my guest Mark Philpott, CEO of NPH Group for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a listen to some of the previous shows in our series. We spoke to Lady Tanny Gray Thompson and discussed the parallels between elite sport and being a small business owner. We also talked about the power of networking with Ollie Barrett and Caroline Theobald, and we discovered more about how the collective power of the North East England Chamber of Commerce could support your business with CEO John McCabe. To discover these episodes and to be sure not to miss out on our future shows, follow the Why Small Business Matters on your podcast app. And to find out more about the Help to Grow Management Programme and some of the other ways Northumbria University can help your business, head to northumbria.ac.uk slash help to grow.